This is ridiculous. Everybody is talking about Devin, the new AI agent that's supposed to automate software engineering. But looking at the demo, I don't really see what's so special about it. I mean, we've had AI agent frameworks for close to a year now, and you've been able to use tools like Autogen and ChatDev to create simple apps like what was shown in the Devon demo, and I don't really see what's so different about Devon. At the end of the day, it's still just a ChatGPT wrapper with some additional logic telling it how to process tasks, a UI, and maybe a few integrations, but it's not something revolutionary like Sora, for example. In fact, I think most of the features shown in the demo can be replicated pretty easily using the ChatGPT API. API, and I will prove it to you by doing just that by the end of this video. Moreover, I think the Cognition Labs team is presenting benchmarks in bad faith and trying to ride this hype train. And even if Devon somehow lived up to all of the hype, I still don't think it changes the trajectory of software engineers becoming AI supervisors. Devon just becomes a tool in their tool belt. Now let me show you what the Cognition Labs team actually presented so we can be on the same page and you can see what the hype is all about. Hey. I'm Scott from Cognition AI, and today I'm really excited to introduce you to Devin, the first AI software engineer. Let me show you an example of Devin in action. I'm gonna ask Devin to benchmark the performance of Llama on a couple different API providers. From now on, Devin is in the driver's seat. First, Devin makes a step-by-step -step plan of how to tackle the problem. After that, it builds a whole project using all the same tools that a human software engineer would use. Devin has its own command line, its own code editor, and even its own browser. In this case, Devin decides to use the browser to pull up API documentation so that it can read up and learn how to plug into each of these APIs. Here, Devin runs into an unexpected error. Devin actually decides to add a debugging print statement, reruns the code with the debugging print statement, and then uses the error in the logs to figure out how to fix the bug. Finally, Devin decides to build and deploy a website with full styling as the visualization. You can see the website here. All of this is possible today because of the advancements that we've made in both reasoning and long-term planning. It's a really hard problem, and we've only just started, but we're super excited about the progress that we've made so far. Okay, so first let's talk about the benchmarks. And the one that they seem to be highlighting the most is their performance on the SWE bench. There is a huge problem with how this company is reporting its results on this benchmark, which I will get to in a second. But first, let's look at the benchmark itself. Now, when I see a benchmark that has Llama outperforming GPT-4, I'm telling you, that is a red flag. I don't know if you've used Llama, but it is totally junky. I mean, I tried to use it for a project recently, and instead of answering my prompt, it literally continued to write out the prompt for me. I mean, this is the quality of this kind of model. So if you're telling me that Llama can outperform GPT-4 on this benchmark, then the benchmark itself is worthless. So I dug deeper into the actual benchmark and the sort of data that was being used and what was expected of the models. And what I found was that this benchmark is measured by passing a code base to a model, as well as an open GitHub issue describing a particular bug, and then expects the model to write some code changes in order to fix that bug and pass a certain number of tests. So immediately I have a number of concerns because this benchmark is based on public GitHub issues, which means that this is data that could be easily and inadvertently added to a model's training data set and could potentially invalidate the whole benchmark. Additionally, if you look at the quality of the actual text that is supposed to be passed into the model, you can see that it is very low quality. You got a bunch of messages that are all concatenated into one block that don't include author names. You got GitHub issues template text in there that just distracts from everything, stack traces, and all of this noise that ultimately adds up to a low quality input and an ambiguous problem to solve, which is really the issue here. Because what if the model decides to solve the problem in a way that wasn't anticipated by the authors of the library or of this benchmark? And who is to say that the solution that the benchmark assumes is correct is truly the best solution? With all of those issues, I don't think it's a surprise that even Devin only correctly resolves 13% of those issues unassisted. But let me tell you about the biggest problem with this benchmark and what Cognition Labs is reporting. And that is the fact that they're comparing apples to oranges. This benchmark is intended for AI models. That means you put in the text, you get a response, and you evaluate that response. However, 
Cognition Labs is using an AI agent to do this benchmark, which is a completely unfair comparison. I'm gonna make a separate video talking about the difference between AI models and AI agents, but at a high level, AI agents are able to use models and other tools to accomplish a certain task, which means they can do some research, they can run experiments, and eventually arrive at an answer that's almost guaranteed to be better than an AI model. It's the equivalent of comparing test performance on students that are just taking the test on their own with no assistance versus somebody that has access to the internet can call all the experts that they need and run a bunch of experiments to see that their answer is correct before they submit it. It's an absolutely unfair comparison. And keep in mind that Devon isn't based on a new AI model. It actually just uses APIs under the hood to use the existing models. Because at the amount of funding that the company has received, they don't have the amount of money that you need to train a legitimate model to perform this well. And I saw people mentioning that the founder admitted that they were just using ChatGPT under the hood, but then those messages were actually removed. So we'll see what actually happens with that, but I really doubt that they're using their own model under the hood for Devon. All of that being said, let me show you how easy it actually is to replicate most of what was shown in that demo with ChatGPT and some basic code. So following the Devon demo, here are the key points that they demonstrated that Devon is able to do. So let's go ahead and just run through them all. I'm going to make this very high level. This isn't going to be as detailed as Devon. Obviously they've spent a long time on this project. I'm just trying to show you that at the core, it's not really as sophisticated as it might look and it can actually be really easy to put a very impressive demo together. So let's go ahead and start with the UI. I created this new project here. So we got our server, we got UI. I used create react app to just spin all of this up. I went to chat GPT and had it write a few components for me. So now we have this page. This is gonna be super basic, right? Now let's have it go ahead and write a server for us. I didn't quite like the way that it integrated with OpenAI, so I just copied some other code that I had that does it pretty well. I'm gonna go ahead and paste it in here and tell it here I use this file. Now it's gonna update my server to use the OpenAI integration that I'd prefer. And this is generally how I work with ChatGPT. And that's why, again, Devon isn't such a big leap for me because I already use AI in a big way to accelerate my coding. All right, now we got our server up and running. Let's go ahead and try this out. Create a graph of the top 10 countries by GDP and the trend over the last five years. Okay, so ChatGPT responded and out of the box, it already has some steps on there, which we're gonna clean up and we're gonna have it return to us in a formatted way so that we can decide if we need to do more research, if we want it to code or what else we wanna do. So let's make this look a lot more similar to the Devon demo. Okay, so I'm gonna create this prompts file, which is going to contain all of my different templates that I wanna use. Okay, so here's my prompt for the planning. The current task is to create a plan for writing software given the user prompt plan out the steps necessary to do this. Each step can be of one type, plan, code, run code, research, or communicate. Respond with a JSON array containing a very concise description of the tasks needed to accomplish the user's goal and the type of task. For example, and then I give it an example. So let's add this as our system prompt for creating plans. This time when we submit, I expect to see a JSON object. Okay, so here's what the model responded with. It's gonna break up this task into multiple different steps. It's gonna do some research to find a reliable data source for the GDP information. It wants to create a plan here to decide on the programming languages and libraries, which we can skip over. And then it's gonna have a few different code steps to implement the different features to accomplish my goal. Ultimately, it's gonna to try to run the code and then communicate the result back to me. So looking at the list of things demonstrated in the Devon demo, we can go ahead and check off the UI. We now have an ability to plan. Now I know this isn't nearly as sophisticated as Devon's planning capabilities. I'm just trying to show you that it's not that difficult to get a model to return a plan and then be able to execute on different steps of that plan. And because we made the plan in this JSON format, we can now use these types to route things between different steps in our agent. So we can now route this task to a coding part of the agent, which is going to generate code for us. So let's go ahead and do that now. Actually, before writing the code, we should go ahead and do the research to figure out which APIs to use. So let's show that browser demo. Okay, so to browse, we can use Selenium, which is a very common web browsing library. So I went ahead and asked ChatGPT to write me the code for that. Okay, now that we have our scraper, we're gonna just take this research task and paste it in and see what happens. Look at that, it opens the browser window, right? I mean, it's just like the demo. This is the kind of stuff that's happening behind the scenes. 
By the way, I actually switched to Bing because it's going to be easier to scrape. All right, it's opening up the page, going to Bing. It's going to put in the search query and click on the first result. I mean, it's as easy as that. I just had ChatGPT write this scraper for me in you know a matter of minutes, and it's able to go and retrieve data from the top results. So it's not a particularly difficult challenge. There is an additional data extraction component, and I'll make a separate video about how to scrape all these websites, but this isn't a big challenge either, as we can figure out what's important on the page and pull that out for our specific use case. Okay, now we want the model to actually write some code for us. Okay, so here's the code writing module which I've created, which is really pretty simple. It accepts the prompt, which again was taken from our plan, and it runs it through ChatGPT. I gave it a prompt that says, you know, you're specifically supposed to write a .js file, respond only with the code, and let's see it write our JS file. Okay, now we got my code over here. Okay, so it wrote this code and I tried to run it, but I got an error. And now what we're going to do is show how easy it is for an AI agent to actually adjust the code on its own. So let's write an additional code fixer. Okay, so to accomplish this, I wrote two different prompts. I have one that is going to be used as the system prompt to fix the code, and one that is going to be used as a template to submit both the errors as well as the broken code. So in this case, we're telling the agent that the user will submit some code and the error, and your task is to fix the code and write a JS file just like before. Okay, so with all of that in place, we're gonna tell it to go fix the code found here, and we tell it the error, we're gonna again ask ChatGPT to come up to the solution and write the answer to my code too. Okay, we got a my code too, so let's see what it's done. Looks like it fixed the import, so let's try to run that. Check it out, we just got the GDP for all of these different countries for the year 2020. And we just had an AI write all of this, we just built this with ChatGPT. We had it write some code, we executed the code, We got the result, it was an error, we had it fix the code, it wrote some better code, and now we got our data. So you can see how you can chain all of these events together and arrive at something like Devon AI. Write code, run code, got the error, it was able to troubleshoot it and it fixed the bug. So we've essentially demonstrated all of the capabilities of Devon AI, and now all I have to do is just weave all of those things into a framework that follows the step-by-step -step instruction, and when it runs into errors, it recursively fixes them before moving on to the next step. I think there's also pieces where it could communicate with the user. I mean, you can see where I'm going with this. Bottom line is, it's not that hard to create an AI agent framework like Devon and show a really impressive result of an app writing code and then fixing itself. Now what this all highlights is just how much hype there is in AI right now and people can't really tell what is significant and what isn't. Sometimes the hype is fully justified such as when OpenAI announced Sora. Other times, such as with Devon, I think it's really pretty superficial and relatively easy to replicate. Now I understand that what I built is a disconnected small version of what the Devon AI team has put together. My goal was really just to show you that there's nothing revolutionary here and that it's just really weaving some code together. Now just because I'm not impressed with Devon's current demo doesn't mean that it's not going to improve and keep automating more and more different tasks. I just think that there is a long tail of tasks that are going to be difficult to automate and are still going to require software engineers to be in the loop to supervise the AI and guide it in the right direction. Understanding user requirements, translating them to technical ones, and knowing how to prompt the AI so that it does the right thing. I'll leave you with these thoughts from Andre Karpathy, one of the biggest names in the AI space, who compared the automation of software engineering to self-driving cars, and this was one of the comments that he made. Back to my example of self-driving, my first demo drive in an early Waymo was 2014, and it was already great. It took me around for a 20-minute drive. From that perfect demo, it was one decade before I could pay for a drive in a Waymo. I have a lot more thoughts on all of this, so make sure to check out this video where I talk about the future of software engineering and whether it even makes sense to learn how to code anymore. I'll see you there.